share this on LinkedIn real quick. And thank you for uh, coming on. Oh, no, absolutely. Pleasure. Cool. Uh, and we'll wait just a minute while um, I think the stream catches up. And for anyone watching already, let us know. It's always fun in the chat. Uh, let us know if, if you can hear us. And also, it's really fun to see where people are watching from. So it's all awesome if you want to post in, in the comments on YouTube or LinkedIn uh, where you're watching from. Yeah, also, like, you know, if you if you guys give me a little bit of tidbits on what you guys do and what you guys are interested in, hopefully I can cater the conversation in that direction. Yeah, and that's also wanna... great to know. <laughs> why, yes. why, why is anyone watching uh, interested in learning more about MLOps or data ops? All right, and the stream looks live. So I'm, I'm sure I'm pretty sure people have been hearing us. <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, cool. Um, I'll just do a quick intro on on what this is before we uh, get into talking to you. So uh, my name is Sage Elliott. I'm going to be the host for today's robust and responsible AI event. Uh, we're a community of AI machine learning practitioners, researchers, designers, and much more. Anyone kind of working in the AI ML space. Um, if you want to stay connected with us, one of the best ways of doing so is our Slack channel right now, which you can join in the YouTube um, event description. Uh, you can think of this event kind of as a live podcast, so I'll be interviewing guests starting with a specific topic, and uh, we should have time for some questions at the end or throughout the, the conversation. Feel free to post those questions in the chat. And I always encourage everyone to stay connected and talk in the chat, even if we didn't get to your questions. It's really fun during live events to kind of meet new people and stay connected. Um, and if you want to come on for an event, if you have a story to tell or some sort of technology you want to talk about, reach out to me. Again, one of the best places is the R Squared Slack, or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. And today we have our guest, Caitlin, with us to explain how to strategize for data and ML ops. Before we get into that, though, would you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your background? Um, hi, actually, that's a big topic, but uh, I'll first introduce myself. Uh, hi, my name's Ketan. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Union. Um, I'm also, uh, prior to Union, I was at Lyft and stints at Oracle, uh, Amazon, high frequency trading, all kinds of things. Just some small companies, right? <laughs> yeah, I worked with a few small companies, tried to do my little bit to move the cog. Um, and then uh, basically came a time, uh, we open sourced a project called Flight from Lyft. This was started at the team that I used to lead uh, for building models, for uh, machine learning models at Lyft, and then eventually uh, I started leading the machine learning platform that led to uh, parts of flight being open source. And uh, earlier in 2021, I started Union based on the ideas of flight and what I've learned in the last few years to essentially cater to a lot more number of companies uh, and get them to the, uh, or share the learning that I've had in my journey with them. At those companies you mentioned working at, were you always kind of in a data and machine machine learning role? Crazy. I was never in a data and a machine learning role. Uh, I I did do a bunch of work in machine learning in 2005, six, doesn't count really. Like I had a neural network model, did not work. I mean, did some statistical uh, models for, for behavioral detection. It was an, an anti-money laundering system that I worked on. Um, then uh, I did my master's at Georgia Tech, and I I, I contributed to ML Pack and some things. But again, uh, more as a from high performance computing point of view. And I I also worked on GPU GPU programming, so CUDA prior to 1.0. I, I have often I often say this like I worked on a lot of things that were. Uh, before they were cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, you made them cool. <laughs> no, I don't think so. But yeah, I didn't really time them then. <laughs> Hopefully, this is not that time. This is, this is the time when I'm working on something at this school and then I'm like doing my bit for the world. Um, 2000, uh, uh, high frequency trading is where, again, there were machine learning models in finance. Um, but then besides that, actually worked on OR models again, and we never call them models as such. Like I worked in uh, Amazon logistics in the beginning. Uh, I, I heard still some of my code still, you know, in there. And so it was, um, 
optimizing package deliveries and like the graphs and optimizing those graphs. And these are classical NP hard problems. Uh, and so you have to use uh, techniques to actually optimize, or potentially come to a close to an optimal solution. So was involved in that. Yeah, and then then was there was a lot of mapping, which include like I think it's a data domain problem. Uh, like we you know in the classical sense, when people talk about data, they talk about Hadoop and big data. I, I came from a different world. I came from like mapping data and you know I call it like you know, transportation data and EDI exchanges and so on and high like fixed protocol, which is the high frequency trading, which is again data, but in a different world. Um, and then at at Arco, a little bit prior to that, I, I led block storage, so core storage like uh, teams, and I yeah, and I built uh, core uh, computing and networking kind of fundamentals. Yeah, so all over the place. Nowhere did I work in ML data specifically, but as Steve Jobs would say, "Don't join the dots, right? You know, they will join. <laughs> they look back." That's awesome. <laughs> was there something specific? I know uh, you were working in in all these kind of different uh, data data domains. Was there something specific that that made you really want to go, I guess, further into the the ML and data kind of tool space? Like, obviously, I'm I'm assuming as you were building out these solutions, um, there are problems, which we'll get to in a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, you know, I, I will not talk about like how did we arrive at the set of solutions I did, but like I'll tell you about like what got me interested. Uh, at Lyft, again, I joined Lyft because I was missing mapping. It was one of the best projects in my life that I've worked on is mapping. It's just so amazing. And I started from a point of knowing nothing about how the world is stitched and to doing like a, a talk about, uh, you know, building maps in your phone. Uh, and and uh, I missed that. I really missed it. And so I joined Lyft and I saw that, you know, and my first project actually at Lyft was, I don't know, in 2016, if you ever used Lyft, it was, uh, it, 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 the cars would kind of fly across the building and spin like helicopters. And I like... do. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and then my project kind of fixed it. Uh, so uh, that was one of my first contributions. Uh, and it actually used a machine learning model uh, and in real time. And so that's a very, this is 2016 and very few people. It's a very, very elegant solution to the problem. Um, and what that ended up was I, I started leading a team that was building machine learning models. I don't know how. <laughs> and I, we were responsible to deliver uh, models in real time. I wouldn't say real time, every few minutes, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes into production. And that actually I saw the power that if you could take data, like data on its own, not that useful. What, what do you do? Like you just store it in S3 and pay the money to like uh, AWS. That's not really what it's where it really comes to you know, becomes a power is when you use it to actually derive insights or actually even better derive business value and drive products. And I saw machine learning was actually the way to bring that, that value to the end user. And I, I think this momentum is going to catch on and Go further, and that's that's what got me interested. And I was like, I worked with autonomous cars, and so on. I'm mean, just it was just amazing for me to learn just what was happening in that world. That's awesome. Very cool background to come from, and totally agree about right. Data itself isn't valuable. You have to do something with it, even if that's you looking at it to analyze it. Or now, if in this world, like to the the age today is really exciting because of all the different applications that we can do with machine learning and all the data that we have, it's really fun to see machine learning go to all these fields I never even expected or that a lot of people don't think about all the time. Yeah, I call them ML products actually. Actually, this is a category, right? So it's not just means and model. It is an entire means to get value to the customer. That's an ML product, right? It uses data and machine learning techniques to actually kind of drive customer delight. And that's yeah. what's happening more and more. It has happened for a while, like, but in like very, very uh, few scenarios. Like, you can think about like cases like you know recommendations engine and so on. But now it's like pervasive, and I think it's going to become even bigger in the next few years. I do that's too. Why. It's an exciting field to be in. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm, um, yeah, I'm honored to be part of it. So. Uh, me too. 
Um, before we get into the kind of strategic part for ML and data ops, um, could we maybe define a little bit about what ML ops is or what data ops is or how you think about it a little bit? Yeah, it's like <laughs> uh, ML ops. Um, I don't use that word that often, but uh, in in my opinion, and this is completely my opinion, uh, is the the word operationalize means to get something into the into a way that is useful, right? Like, like make this operational um, or get it working, really, right? And Machine learning on its own is great in theory. It's amazing in theory, in fact. Uh, but when you put it to, when you want to delight your users, you have to operationalize it. Uh, and so the ML ops is the art or the engineering of the art of machine learning, right? Um, and similarly, data ops is, in my opinion, again, is the engineering of the, the art of data data science, um, or just simply understanding data, or uh, you know, capturing data. So, and both of them together are, I think, re required to deliver fantastic user experiences for, you know, machine learning products. Yeah, I think Hopefully, it's very good. kind of going back to like what you're saying, the data itself isn't useful. And likewise, a machine learning model itself trained isn't useful if it's not out doing something. I feel kind of like the data ops and ML ops is the piece between that, right? You have your data and okay. you want to get it out doing something useful. Maybe that's with a machine learning model. Maybe it's in some other, other application. And then you have, likewise, you have a machine learning model, uh, but it's not useful until you have it deployed somewhere and you're doing something with it. And, yeah. and then typically part of ML ops, you also want to kind of uh, monitor over time to make sure it's still reliable as well. Okay. Yeah, like, I think the entire journey or the engineering aspects of making a machine learning model operationalized or operationalizing a machine learning model rather yeah. and that that like you know that don't get me wrong it's not about like some people are actually thinking and said oh i have a model i have i, I have a model let me do the other thing i like, no, you don't have a model but you have a model probably on your jupyter notebook that doesn't mean you have a model <laughs> uh you have to have a model in production scenario in 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 a way that it can be deployed and if need be rolled back and changed and monitor and and the outcomes need to be measured. And there's so many things that you need to do. Um, and maybe that's all kind of under the category of ML ops. It's too big a category. And then there is the ML category, which is even bigger. So, Yeah, for anyone new or learning machine learning and you're in Jupyter Notebooks, unfortunately, usually they're not used in production. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we have tried to use them. So if you use Flight ever, um, there is a paper mill plugin, try it out. Yeah, it works in a limited setting. It's it's hard to productionize. And the reason why is the nonlinear way of like thinking about the problem, right? And then and then, you know, sometimes it's like it, it's a great tool to explore, it's a great tool to document. I would love to find out a way to get it together. But at the moment we have not yet cracked that code. That's cool that you're working on it. I've seen some other people kind of working on the same problem. And one day, maybe you can just have a Jupyter notebook and then you take, you can uh, easily take like artifacts from it and deploy those artifacts, which is, which is cool. I think a workflow like that could be very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Like it basically jiving with the user's flow is what you really need to do. And it's like, and, and there are many schools of thought. So I wouldn't like preach on one or the other side because I, I, I really don't have a say at the moment. What I've seen is many wrong things being done purely with Jupyter, but then also I've seen many wrong things being done when you're not using Jupyter. <laughs> it's not about like that. It's about the hygiene and the things that you follow and the standards and the, the style, right? Which is right. It's just personal. That uh, pivots perfectly into our next question, which is what are some common mistakes people make when building their data or ML pipelines? And you could draw from uh, maybe some experience you've seen in the field or from maybe you know, if you're seeing people um, build something and then pivot to a, a tool you've created that kind of solves that problem. Oh, uh, this kind of tees into a talk that I'm going to do in a few weeks. Um, where where is the about, talk going to be at? We can uh, uh, post the at, link about it later. At Meta, uh, it's like uh, at scale conference. Uh, and it's, it's specifically from the point of view at scale, like things that you kind of just imagine at, at any kind of decent, reasonable scale. 
to higher scale, they, they just they just break. Um, and yeah, so some of the things um, that I've learned over a period of time, and and this is like so we will fly it to lift. And we didn't, like, I don't think we got it right for the first time. We didn't get it right for the second time. I don't know if we have fully gotten it right for the third time, but that's what we have at the moment. It seems to be going well for many different use cases. So we've kind of gotten some things right, uh, but I'm sure that there are things to improve on and we will continue to improve on them. But what I learned through that process is that, you know, uh, and I don't know, have you re read the book by Geoffrey West, Scale? uh I, if you have not i highly recommend people to read the book it's a fantastic book it's the it's about finding regularity within anything that scales so like you know an example a classic example or there is like uh mammals of any the smallest being i guess uh, like a rat a shrew uh to a largest being a whale all of them have the same number of heartbeats in their lifetime uh, and so he plots it all on curves and like, you know, uh, it's essentially finding mathematical similarities across uh, across species. And I, I got inspired by that and that's how I, I'm creating the talk. But what, do you, what I found is that there are laws that govern the scale aspects of uh, machine learning. And few of them are around uh, infrastructure like we always forget that we all like when you're when you in machine learning you're very model focused you think about the model you're like oh yeah i, I built a model then now there is a slight bit of movement no 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 models not only you need data like models and data together but actually the third aspect is also very important which is the infrastructure as well as the the config or, or infrastructure config that means because eventually you want your model to be reproducible eventually you want your uh your requirements saying you want it to be scalable from like zero to 100 machines like you you have all of this and then that has to be captured through infrastructure uh like changes and so on uh, another aspect is like i think whenever we start small we kind of things work right if you're a one data scientist somewhere i don't think you need most of ml ops for like that world itself um that's because you're probably solving the problem for yourself uh, you can see the outcomes on your own and hopefully you have that, you know, the reasonable uh, set of assumptions that you want to look for and you are looking for them. But the moment you are trying to do anything that's really affecting end users, you need you need ways of scaling this out, right? And what we often forget is that, that people, the number of people, the type of people and interaction between people and tech stack is a big variable. The moment you start scaling anything out, um like you know how how people collaborate uh it's often that happens in in large uh, not even large like any kind of team is data scientists build a model throw the model over the wall and then they just kind of deploy it it's, it doesn't work it causes friction it doesn't really work and so your system should take care of uh handling this complexity of like people interactions and also handling the complexity of tech stacks like some people like Python, some people like, you know, Jupyter Notebooks, as you say, some people don't like Jupyter. Like this, this tech stack change has to be kind of addressed. And the last part to all of this is resilience, right? Like at, at any kind of production, you don't want things to go wrong just randomly in production without an explanation. Uh, or even if, even if you have an explanation, you should be able to get to that explanation. So you need to be able to reproduce, get the lineage, get to understand and have monitoring in place to like go back to that, right? So these three things actually govern how you should approach building the system today and we are seeing a big research or not research but like a big um, shift in building ml platforms now in many many companies that are successfully delivering machine learning products um and and uh, uh, that's where flight is used quite a bit uh, already in many many companies and and the reason why we build flight is we, like in the three categories of, you know, yeah, there are known knowns. We absolutely know certain problems on day one. Uh, we have known unknowns. We, we do know certain problems kind of may exist, but but we don't really, we try to push it under the rug. We try to solve for them. Oh, well, that's why we took three iterations really. And the unknown unknowns, and I don't think you should solve for them. That's like the over engineering aspects. But as we were going, we saw some unknown unknowns and we started tackling them as we went through. 
And that's why it's been scaling pretty well for many companies. Um, so hopefully that answers your question in a long-winded way, but through a period I've learned these like, multitude of things and we've tried to synergize them into flight in the beginning and then some parts will go in Union as we build Union along. Awesome, yeah, and we'll talk about a, a little bit more about flight in Union in a second. I think you already got to a little bit of this. Um, then kind of the next part of this is what, what are some ways that teams can start strategizing uh, strategizing for these ML and data ops problems. I guess like you've mentioned all the the kind of various stages and a little bit of how to think about it. When, when do you think is a good time, I guess, in the development phase to start thinking about infrastructure? And I'm sure ideally that's right away. <laughs> yeah, just like it, but it's not before defining the outcome, right? Like it's like, definitely I think a business outcome has to be defined first. So sometimes that takes a while, right? That may not be at a two people company or a two people project, uh, may not be, again, I don't know. It may be also depending on the product that you have. But once you have defined the outcome and you want predictability around that outcome, yeah, it's the time you should start looking at these things. Uh, also, the other thing is, you know, having faith that your idea is going to become bigger than what it is today, right? Like, and so you'll immediately hit scale. Um, and when I'm think, talking about scale, don't think about like Facebook scale and Google scale or so on. I'm talking about any reasonable scale. Um, and that will happen right? naturally because that's how like software has the scale aspects with it. And we want to better, better help that you know, our software system scale. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Um, all right. So you've mentioned flight and union, and we know that uh, you're at Union AI and you're <laughs> the creator of flight. Can you tell us a little bit more about those products and, and what they do and, and when people might want to use them? Yeah. So flight uh, is an open source product. It's part of Linux Foundation. It's a graduate top level product. Uh, it's free to use. Uh, it's a completely permissive license, Apache 2.0, and Union does not own the trademark, even for Flight. For Flight is a standalone product. The only reason why I kind of have a little bit more say today in Flight is because I, I wrote the first line of the code base. Um, probably at some point people will kick me out, and that, that's completely fine. Um, but at the moment, um, just because of the, the association and the long history with the project, I have more of a say in the product. Um, Union is a commercial company and uh, Union, the goal of Union is to one, help people. Over the last one year, I've been working with teams, lots of teams who use Flight or tried to use Flight and probably some of them failed use flight and I oftentimes found that it was because of the lack of having the expertise to run Kubernetes at scale or like even run flight at scale and, and then they were like hey why don't you know this or why don't you help us and I was like okay I uh, that's where you know we started creating parts of union to first help the companies that actually want to use flight on its own um, but beyond that also uh like you know offer certain other specific things that we have learned through a period like how do you scale easily how do you manage infrastructure and so on uh just real so, quick so we uh we mentioned flight and union and a little bit about them could you take a step back and i guess talk just very briefly about what flight does yeah yeah uh, absolutely yeah sure uh for those so who don't know i know a lot of people know the the package already as well uh, I don't think enough people know it, <laughs> to be honest. So thank you for having me here and let me giving me a chance to talk about it. Um, so it is a it is a platform uh, built for companies that want to run orchestration for their machine learning and also for their data uh, jobs. Um, it is designed to be serverless from ground up for the users. The way it achieves the serverless capabilities is through through Kubernetes, um, and it is uh, built on top of Kubernetes. Uh, so you need to have a Kubernetes cluster. Um, it can scale beyond one Kubernetes cluster 
for large, large uh, workload types. The basic unit of work within flight is essentially a task. And a task can be anything, can be arbitrarily complex, it's version. It is, uh, it is uh, what do you say, it's fully declarative. Uh, and, the, and, and, and from the system's point of view, the task is opaque. What the task really does, flight doesn't really know. But it, it gives it a boundary. And that boundary is like, hey, this task has to be run. I have to specify, I have to give it these inputs. And eventually, it'll produce some outputs that I know of. And this is what it knows. Um, and then flight allows you to run this one task on its own. So you can use it like a job scheduler. Right? Like you can use it to schedule jobs. Uh, these jobs are little more than just regular opaque jobs. They have, you know, the boundary conditions. And that's very beneficial because the moment this happens, you can keep a trace on what's happening. And trace is very important at scale. Um, and then once you have that, you can put together multiple of these jobs or tasks right together to form a thing called a workflow um and so native scheduler that allows you to build workflows dynamically and abstracts the infrastructure from the user that's what flight is um it's not a workflow engine some people will say yeah, it's, it's, yes workflows are part of it but it's not just a workflow engine it does the job orchestration also which is very very important for um, machine learning practitioners specifically and then also data practitioners in many cases yeah so it's a way of uh creating these tasks and then yeah. kind of tying them all together so that you can yeah. execute them in that order repeatedly exactly and the repeatedly the very very important characteristic right because it's like it versions everything it tracks everything so because of this we had to create our own type system to create our own language and protobuf we had to like, we had to do a lot of things and and the goal was how do we make it super easy for people to share ideas connect pieces connect arbitrary pieces like a spark job to a ray job to a dash job to a, to a simple python pandas data frame right and that needed us to like kind of really go to the core and like think about things um and so it's not really like any like other orchestrators it is more infrastructure focused um and we've also found that Kubernetes was not the right abstraction for many of our users. Right? That was the other thing. Um, so we ended up building essentially a layer of abstraction on top of Kubernetes, if you think about it. Uh, but also, we realized that not everything runs on Kubernetes. So Snowflake and Redshift and like BigQuery and and then also like SageMaker and all these things probably are optimal in certain cases. And so we were like, okay, how do you kind of so together these multiple and create a fabric that connects all of these pieces. And over a period, we think uh, a fabric like this has to exist in purely an open source environment. Otherwise, that, uh, it's never possible to build the right thing for the users. Right. You're you're telling me not everyone is just using Kubernetes. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, everyone is using Kubernetes or will be at some point. I think uh, uh, for better or for worse. Like I, I I know there are people who are like no, I hate Kubernetes, but I'm like there's so much engineering that's going on in it. There's so much capacity that's going on in there, and there's so much adoption. The, the barrier to entry for other players is a little hard. Um, I don't have the guts to do that part, but I think there are enough things available in Kubernetes that you can actually convert it to a superpower. And that's what our goal is. And, and I'll just mention, um, I posted in the chat, but all the links to Flight and Union, if anyone wants to check them out more, all the links are in the description. So you can go check out the, the Union AI site as well as the flight.org. And I know uh, we're we're getting close on time. I have one other question I want to ask you. Uh, besides yeah. Union AI and Flight, uh, what's something in the data or ML slash AI field that you find exciting right now? Like at the beginning, we were talking about you know applications outside of kind of just traditional or what people think of traditional ML stuff. Do you have any applications or fields that you're kind of excited to see more machine learning in? Oh, yeah, interesting. I, I love what's happening in biotech and climate uh, green stuff. Um, I mean, climate tech. Uh, it's it's the type of stuff that we want to support. Like, I think it's a 
for us all to have equity in in health and have a it's our duty to have you know help everybody have a good life a chanted good life i think that that's what really excites me from inside i i don't know if that's really you know we can do much about it but i hope we can actually really really help them along the way and that's where i see a lot of like users using it and a lot of other people doing fantastic work like i don't even understand half of it and it's just amazing um similarly in climate tech like i think there are people trying to really it, it is a real problem whether i know there are some people who disagree <laughs> but i think it's a real problem and i um and uh, i think machine learning is a solution for many many aspects in here and i think that's uh, i'm really excited to see how people are leveraging uh, machine learning techniques um and of course like just purely bringing the light to our daily lives just like you know uh, the other day i saw like some that di di dynamic translation stuff like I, I don't know if you saw mu zero like was able to improve compression ratio automatic and like i'm like this is like you know silicon valley coming to the real world so eventually yeah it can improve most all aspects of our life and so why not it's amazing yeah, I think it, it's yeah, it's really cool seeing it used in all these different fields, and and I think I love your point of saying kind of no matter the fields that it's used in, usually it's you know the idea is to make our lives better and easier in a lot of different yeah. ways. So it's really exciting yeah. seeing that cross all different fields right now, which is really exciting. Yeah, I think eventually it's going to cross. It. It's a weird way to say this because software will be there, but it probably has a bigger impact than even software. So it's amazing. Awesome. I think that's a, a, a great way to kind of end our stream right now. So I want to thank everyone for tuning in and watching. Um, and thank you, Caitlin, for coming on. I'm going to go ahead and, and end the stream right now. Um, real quick, I just I want to say one thing before I go. Yeah, go Yellow Jackets. Yes, I, I went to Georgia Tech, and I thank you, Ravi. Yeah, woohoo. Uh, yeah, I actually, I will uh, leave one minute if, if you don't have to go right this second. Um, if there's any questions from anybody still watching, uh, for Caitlin before we go. If not, um, I know that you can connect with them on all the flight.org community stuff. And you can Our... also uh, send me any questions in our Slack as well. Yeah. And also, you know, uh, thank you, Sage, for having me. I think Y Labs and the team is just doing amazing stuff. So shout out to you guys. Uh, it's really um, an important piece of problem as well within like making sure that the outcomes are right and keep make, keeping them right so kudos. thank you yeah <laughs> we're part of another part of the ml ops space uh yes. is kind of the, the monitoring part which is what we're working on at y labs but all right i'm gonna go ahead and end the live stream um and goodbye everyone thank you again for watching